Have you ever wanted to live in another country? One of the more popular reasons given for why people want to retire early is so they can travel more. But did you know it's possible for you to live abroad without being independently wealthy? And you can do it with little ones. Sarah Lee Kane from High Fiving Dollars is doing it now with her husband and their young son. And she's here on the podcast to help you get the numbers and realities of living as an expat. In this episode, we get into how she found a career that allows her to live abroad, how finances can vary with every country, and it can be crazy, and tips on how you can get started. So if you're itching to travel, but you're short on funds, this is your episode. Sarah's love of traveling and adventures started early. Even as a kid, one of the reasons she chose teaching was because it could help her with traveling and seeing the globe. That was something I've always wanted to do. I I tell people this story and they think it's kind of weird, but like when I was in grade school, I was like, I want to travel the world. I was kind of like something I wanted to do. My family's all literally all over the world. I've got cousins in like South Africa, you know, um, US, UK, Australia, um, Hong Kong, like everywhere. And so it was never not an option for me to travel. And so I remember thinking in my head, I'm like, what what can I do that would let me travel and, and have a job, you know, or make money? And I remember a middle school and high school teacher going to Europe to teach. And I thought, oh, perfect. I'll be a teacher. That was sort of like my decision ahead. I'm like, I'm going to be a teacher because I can travel. I mean, I, I love it. You know, it's, it's a great, it's a wonderful profession, but it was literally like, I want to travel. I'm going to be a teacher. I've had friends who made the switch. And one of the things I kept hearing was be prepared for the unexpected. Each country has its own quirks. Living in China, Sarah's picked up on a few. One big adjustment was dealing with banks. It's a bit like weird. <laughs> I mean, we okay. So in China, bank transfers are like a nightmare. When we first moved here, it was like it would literally take you two hours. You had to fill out all these crazy forms, and they'd have to do government stamps, and then they have to like ask permission to the government to like to exchange money and then transfer to your bank account. And then on certain hours of the day, you can't do it. And you know, it's yeah, it was ridiculous. And I remember. I had a contact with the bank. It still took me an hour and a half. So what we do now is we have a union pay card. So it's kind of like a, a debit card here um, or a visa card, I guess you can say. And so there are ATMs in the U.S. that will take these union pay cards and you can get cash in the U.S. And so what we would do is every um, summer or Christmas or whenever we, we are happy to be U.S., we will take our union pay cards and we'll go to the ATMs and withdraw cash. So I think it's a limit. It's like a thousand dollars a day or something like that. And so you're literally paying for the ATM fee in China, which is like a dollar. Okay. And then you're paying for the ATM fee, um, from your bank, which is, I think a dollar, dollar 50. So you're paying two fifty for that. And then whatever the exchange rate is for that, it's usually pretty good. Like it's pretty close to what it says on xe.com Before it was like, you had to pay whatever the exchange rate the bank, you know, um, had, and then it was like, $40 from China and then you get to pay, I think, another $20 from whatever your bank was in the U.S. So that's it was ridiculous. We've done Western Union, which doesn't really work out in our favor. Um, and I'm a Canadian. So when I used to exchange money or I said you send money to Canada, there's like a limit of a thousand um, Canadian dollars you could send at a time. So, I mean, that it, yeah. So so we've kind of like tried and tested it a gazillion ways. Um, we've done like uploading it or sending money through PayPal. Um, like connecting your bank accounts from China and then sending it that way. Um, Yeah, because the banks here, I don't know. I mean, I I will never attempt to understand banks in China. Um, I think they just try to keep their money in the country. So they make it really difficult for people to, um, to send money out. Now, that's not everywhere. Australia was a bit easier for Sarah when she lived there. I had some money in the bank in Canada and I literally went to Australia and I was like, I want this wired. And my mom just had to say it okay and... It was there like three days later. If you did in China, you had to like kind of deal with, number one, if they don't speak English, you got to get a translator. Number two, the forms are really weird here. <laughs> I, I don't know if they're just weird. And uh, yeah, so there's kind of all that barriers, I suppose. Having lived in several countries, Sarah has plenty of material for a memoir if she wanted to write one. And if you want to try out living as an expat, Sarah has some tips to make sure your finances are taken care of. 
One of the things that my husband and I made sure of is that you you have to have enough money in your uh, whatever home country you're in or whatever. So let's say you're U.S. You make sure you have enough money in your U.S. account for um, your automated payments or, you know, kind of like your um, big expenses like insurance and things like that. So my husband and I have life insurance. We have um, a car back home, so we pay car insurance, obviously. So we have we make sure we have enough to cover that for a whole year. Um, you know, gotcha. even though let's say even though you go back, yeah, even though you go back to the U.S. every couple months, like my husband and I do, we always just make sure you never know because you wouldn't want to be in a position where you're you cannot physically go to the bank and deposit money. I mean, we have these great tools, um, you know, like PayPal and and whatever online software you have to transfer money but you never know the country you're going to what their laws are you know for example for me china you know it's like one one day i literally had to mail my debit card to my mother because i needed wow. i needed her to put i needed her to put money in in my bank account for um i think we, was, we had an emergency and i needed her to just we couldn't wire the money so i had to send her my debit card you know you don't want to put yourself in those kind of positions really go through a fine tooth comb as to what you've been spending in the U.S. Um, you never know, like, I mean, there could be little pesky little fees that, that have been automatically deducted from your bank account you don't need anymore. Um, you know, you want to cancel those. You want to be able to still have an emergency fund in the U.S. because, again, you just never know what might happen. And while we like to think we're prepared, it helps to have someone on our side who can look after things at home. Let's say you rent out your house and... A tree fell on your roof. You need money. Um, you know, like, then again, if you're not physically in the U.S. and you can't handle that stuff, you want to be able to um, have somebody you can trust to do that. Living frugally is key, no matter where you live. But if you're working abroad, it helps to have some money left over so you can send it home. Figure out how much you can send home every month. I'm just really paranoid about keeping too much money in a foreign bank account because I'm not aware of the laws of this country as, as much as I would like you think I do. I mean, there's always, um, you know, language barriers, depending on what country you're in. You never know their laws may change or you're just not aware of it. And, you know, and another thing is you never know. If you, if you, for example, suddenly had to leave, let's say there's an emergency or revolution or whatever, and you had to leave um, and you can't get back in the country, then your money's kind of stuck there. I mean, not to sound, you know, pessimistic or sad about it, but, you know, those are things you have to be aware of that you, that you don't necessarily think about, I think, when you're in your own country. Finally, details matter. Make sure you understand your options for health care and have an idea of insurance requirements of where you're going to live and where you're from. Make sure that your employer is upfront with you about insurance. Um, you know, I've been in situations where they said, oh, yeah, we've got insurance. And then I will go there and they say, well, our insurance is you can go to the doctor and you give us a receipt and we'll reimburse you. You know, great, but what about emergency evacuations? You know, um, you know, when I was in my 20s and, you know, single, I that stuff kind of didn't necessarily bother me. But now that I have a family to take care of, you know, a husband and a young kid, that, that stuff is really important, you know, more important to me now than it was before. Another thing is insurance in, in the U.S. So you want to, it depends. If you're broad for, I think... If I remember, I think it was like 30, if you're, actually, no, sorry, if you're in the U.S. for more than 35 days a year, then you have to have insurance in the U.S. Oh. If you're abroad for more than that, you don't. So, I mean, I don't know if it's changed, and you have to be aware of that. Now, before you head over somewhere, you're probably going to need an income source. So where do you start? Sarah has a few ideas. There are plenty of big corporations that have branches internationally, so that's something that somebody can look into. Um, you know, people I know here have transferred, or they have a specific skill set, so they were they were literally asked to come to um, to China. So that's one avenue. If, if you are a teacher, you know, as for where to where to go, it really depends on how adventurous you are. So in China, there's big cities where you know you can get all the amenities, you know, that that kind of you can sort of get in the U.S. Um, or you can literally kind of go in the middle of nowhere and no one speaks English. Thailand's a really great foreigner-friendly place. You can even just do Europe, you know, because there's just so many, there's so many schools and they're always recruiting. You know, Middle East is another one. I mean, I know a lot of friends in the Middle East who wanted an adventure and decided to go. You know, the easiest way, um, there's lots of teacher exchange programs. So you literally sign up and you say you're willing to do a year abroad. 
and so you can pick the country that you want. So let's say Australia. Then the, the teacher in Australia would say, "I want to go to the U.S.," and so you would be matched up, kind of based on that, or depending on what subject you teach, and then you would you would kind of swap um, houses for the year. I actually had a teacher from Australia do that. Um, my biology teacher went to Australia and taught at his school, and um, this guy taught at our school, and they lived at each other's houses for a whole year. So that was really cool. You can do that. You know, if you want it to be easy, then go through a recruitment agency or do the teacher exchange. If you really want um, as many options as possible, then just start Googling international schools in whatever um, whatever city you're in. You know, talk to pe- people. Like I know people that have gotten jobs through their church. So if you're a member of a church, you can always kind of ask around. Um, you know, the, the recent, the, the, my recent job right now, I literally got it through a friend. Um, it was, I was looking to change and then they said, Oh, someone's my, my, my friend's a principal here. And I said, okay. So I set off my resume and then, you know, two weeks later I got a job. So, um, it can be as easy as that. So if you want to work outside the country, get the ball rolling, start asking, Check with your company's HR and see if they have an office abroad. Keep your eyes open for opportunities as they come up. And while you're waiting, go ahead and get your finances squared away. It'll give you more options. However you do it, I hope you enjoy your new adventure. Special thanks again to Sarah for chatting and giving her take. If you want to find out more about her, please visit High Fiving Dollars. You'll find resources to help you have a better relationship with your money, including a free money course. Couple Money Podcast is made possible because of listeners like you. Every tweet, Facebook like, and pin gets the word out. Thank you so much for your support. Next episode, we're switching things up. Sarah's story continues with a mini show. We'll get into the psychology of money and how we relate to it. She also shares how she and her husband have grown with their money chats and what they've taught each other. Look for the bonus show this weekend. So if you don't want to miss out, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast. It's free and easy. We're out there on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play now. You can also grab the feed off our site so you can listen to the show from whatever podcast service app you prefer. And if you enjoy the podcast and find it helpful, could you please leave a review? It takes about a minute, but it's a huge help and would get the word out on couple money. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. Hold up. 